see you looking great this morning. Most of you. <laughs> Some of us, others are struggling. But it is good to see you. Praise the Lord. Hey, it's almost warm today. Isn't that good news? Praise God. I'm about tired of the ice age. Hey, you, brother. <laughs> yeah, sometimes they have to get cold again. Had a great service at our Magnolia campus today. Ordained some deacons for that campus over there. Great time in the Lord. Great fellowship. Continuing also with our, our study in the book of James. So we'll be looking at that in just a moment. But... Uh, it is good to see you, and I hope that you came ex with expectation of the word. As we get into this, this study, uh, I want you to, before, before we read from our text in, in chapter 3, starting with verse 13, uh, there's a lot of preparation that's gone into this study because we're using it with our lift groups. Now, a lot of preparation goes in anyway, but a lot of more participation. Pastor Strickland and I started looking at this a year ago and working on how we want the flow of the things to go, and then after months of that, then it was turned over to our elders. We discussed it intensely. Then they developed the study guide that goes along with the book of James that they're using in, in leading the group. But uh, I told Tim not too long ago, I said, after looking at some of this, I said, there's probably one section we, sh we could have broke down into two different lessons because there's, although it's within the context of the flow is all there between the, the end of James chapter three and the first five or six verses of James chapter four, it all flows in, in contextual. I said, but there's just a lot of stuff there. I said, I'm not gonna try to preach it all today. We can talk about it more in the lift groups in our, in our evening lift group meetings, but there's just so much there. I said, not only that, I said, it's hard. This is some tough stuff. I and mean, when you get into it, I said, I don't, if you were here last Sunday, uh, I had certain comments after the, the service from emails after service about people from everything, and, you know, about the toughness, the hardness from everything from soaking my toes when I went home for a few hours on, you know, just, but yeah, that's a tough lesson. You start talking about our, our tongue and our mouth. What is it that gets us in the most trouble anyway? Amen. And James is right at the throat. I mean, he, he's not cutting anything out and he's not pulling any punches. Obviously, this is the inspiration of scriptures, the Holy Spirit speaking through James. But, you know, I got to look at that. I thought, you know, some people think I'm a tough preacher. They wouldn't like to hear this. Hearing this directly from James would probably be a little too hard for him. All right. But uh, it's some, I mean, it's, and I told him, I said, when I look at these next two sections, I said, this is, I said, this is like after what he just said in the last session, it's like sticking your finger in the eye and, you know, poking somebody. I said, this gets tough. I mean, if you really take to heart what he's saying here, this isn't easy stuff. I mean, this is, this is down where the nitty meets the gritty. You know what I'm saying? This is where the rubber meets the road. This is where you just separate some boys from the men, all right, and the women from the girls. This is strong spiritual stuff, which is right to the heart of not just the church then, but the church today. This is, you know, it's obviously many of the problems they had in the first century church were many of the problems that are going with churches today. And of course, the obvious thing is our own carnality and dealing with, with immature people in, in their lives. But I mean, he gets, he gets, you know, from one thing, just telling, you know, your mouth's getting you in trouble to your wicked, dirty heart's getting you in trouble. You know, it's, 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 it's right down the, the, the fence line. So I, Tim, number one, the time factor uh, in dealing with so much material. But the, the second factor is just, you know, man, if you can walk out here still standing up after today's sermon, <laughs> much less after last week's sermon, you know, uh, because it's, but it's powerful words. And if you follow the context of it, if, if we're going to be mature in Christ, if we're really going to let God get a hold of our lives and do something that's, you know, not just external kind of painting the old barn, but really, you know, making a change to the life and to the heart, then you have to take these words to heart. I mean, last week we talked about how our lips really display our maturity. That's why he said, you know, don't, don't get up and say, I want to be a teacher. But if your lips, you know, there's, there's levels of maturity you need to be walking in if you're going to, to, to speak to the heart. This, today gets into more like, last week, lips, our, our lips display of maturity. Today, it's our, our life is a display of wisdom. You know, this element of maturity now was there, but now he says, as much as your lips would tell the world where you really are by what you say, we're going to really find out if, if, if there's real wisdom in your life. And if there is, then your life's going to be obviously changing and things are going to be happening in your life. So it starts here in James chapter 3 as we look at it. There we go. In James chapter 3, starts with uh, verse 13. It says, Who among you is wise and understanding? Thank your, thank your wife. Then you show by good behavior the, your deeds in the gentleness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy... Selfish ambition in your heart, do not be arrogant and so lie against the truth. This wisdom is not that which comes down from above, 
But it is earthly, natural. Name clears the one. It's demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, I think I passed it up there. Let me go back. Where jealousy, you can go back to it, but in verse 15, 16, where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder in everything else. But 17, the wisdom from above is first pure and peaceable, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy, good fruits, unwavering, without hypocrisy. And the seed whose fruit is righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Now, if we look at the overall context of where we're at in the book of James, remember last week, don't let everybody think they need to be a teacher. Everybody doesn't need to be a teacher. You're going to, going to be measured by what you say. You're going to, have to stand before God in, in your normal course of life by what you say. But also the, the warning was against living in a hypocritical life, preaching one thing and, and living just the opposite kind of life. And so he's, he's speaking to teachers and he's talking about how you're, you're, you're your mouth's going to really display where you're at. And now he moves forward a little bit more talking about, you know, these teachers, I believe. He continues to exhort in the context of this, those who in the assembly, those in the church who wanted to be the teachers of the word. And, and so this kind of goes in the contextual flow. Remember the Bible with the chapter and the verse break down the way we have it is not the way it was originally. This is a letter. All right. Now, I don't know about you when you write a letter, if you break it down by chapter and verse. Some of you are a little wordy, you probably need to. But <laughs> the idea was that was for being able to reference the letter into where we're talking about something. And so it's been given to us in this way. But what he's telling us is there is a knowledge without wisdom, all right? And that's what he's writing about here. There's a lot of people who get up and spouse things, but they're not necessarily the truth. They may make logical sense, it may be reasonable and rational from a human perspective, but it's not necessarily the word of God. And what he's doing here, he's, he's contrasting true wisdom in, 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 in false wisdom. In fact, he does it in three different aspects. In other words, it's not just good enough, you know, to, to get up and, and to say words, you gotta have something to say. And knowledge here enables us to, to take things apart. I can kind of break it down, but when wisdom enters in, that's what enables us to put things together and relate the things that are in the Bible to where we are in life. We've all heard preachers and teachers who are, you know, who, who uh, get up and they say a lot of good stuff and they may even have some good illustrations, but they somehow miss the heart of what the Bible's saying and what God's word is to us in this moment and from this passage. You know, what is the spirit of God saying in, in, in context with, with the truth of, of God's word, where we are in our life. And these preachers and teachers somehow miss the message of God. They fail to relate the truth of the word of God uh, to us. And even specifically how that word of God can impact our life, make a difference. In our life. It, it, it's like there's this, the anointing oil has not flown over it yet. There's, it, it may be even interesting, so to say, like I say, it can have a lot of good illustrations, but where's the, where's the anointing in it? And where's the truth of God's word for my life in it? In James chapter two, James is speaking to us by, again, the Holy Spirit speaking to us through James. He's saying, show me your faith by your works. If your faith is real, then there's going to be something that's manifest. Now, like what he's saying here in last week and this week is, now let your works do the talking. And this is where he talks about the wise life and how we need to hear from God and not just have an earthly wisdom, an earthly knowledge. And, and, but there, there's a deeper knowledge and there is a deeper wisdom that if we're going to really walk with God and know God, then we're going to have to get a hold of. It's more than just having a little five-minute devotional that makes us feel good about ourselves and walk out saying, well, I'm okay, you're okay. No, there's an application of the Word of God. Now, the, the Bible's filled with, with lots of illustrations about men who think they know what's the right thing to do and it really just being folly. I mean, it looks good, it sounds good. You know, the Bible says there's a way that seems right unto man. That's, that's earthly wisdom. He said, but the way that ends up in death, I mean, I mean, Let's go back to Genesis chapter 11 where you see the story of the Tower of Babel. Somebody thought that was a good idea. Yeah. And they thought, they, they had engineers. Everybody put it on paper. This, we can do this. This looks good, but it only ended in absolute failure and confusion and absolutely a mess. Uh, it probably seemed wise for Abraham to, to turn to and say, hey, let's go down to Egypt. When famine came to Canaan, but God's people were supposed to be in Canaan, not in Egypt. And they ended up in Egypt for 200 years in bondage and captivity. The results of that earthly wisdom 
proved otherwise that it wasn't real wisdom. King Saul, remember when David comes to him, the, the giant's out there and he's taunting him. He said, I can take him. Let me, let me whip him. And so he goes to Saul, tells Saul, you know, I fought a lion and a bear and God will be with me now in this. And Saul said, hey, if you're going to do this and what you need to do, and trust me, I know. And it's always like that. Trust me, I know. <laughs> Logic says, put on some armor. Use mine. Saul is a big man. David is not as big as Saul. It doesn't fit. It hadn't been true. It hadn't been tried. It sounded good, but it wasn't. God had planned for otherwise. The disciples came up with a good idea when they turned to Jesus and said, we've been here a while. There's about 15,000 people here. Why don't we send them away so they can get something to eat? It's a good idea. Reasonable, right? Makes sense. But Jesus said, no, it's not a good idea. Why don't you feed them? We, what do you mean we can feed them? Well, we have here five loaves of bread and two fish. Give it to me. That didn't make any sense. That's stupid. That's irrational. Is it? Jesus is operating by a different set of rules. It's not logical in a human sense. It's based on the word of God and the will of God and the operation of faith. So again, what looks good and reasonable may not be so good and reasonable. Again, scriptures are filled with this. I, I, I preached out of that passage in Acts 27, not, uh, I guess about two years ago when Paul is getting ready to get in, you know, to the boat and he's saying, don't get in the boat. Remember the passage in Acts 27 says, the season for sailing was past. It's not their time of year to get in your sailboat. But the captain of the ship took a look over some things and he and the master of the ship, the owner said, hey, let's go ahead and sell because the weather's good and the clouds are not around and the sky looks great and I know it's not the season for it, but let's, let's sail anyway. The experts said it's okay. It's the reasonable, rational thing to do. Paul's operating by a different set of understanding. Paul says, man, I perceive that if you board this ship, that this ship's going down and you're gonna lose everything. No, 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 no. That's, where did you get that? God told me. You, you almost see the roll of the eyes, can't you? You Christians, you know, you Christians. You ever get that at work? <laughs> it's cool. You know. Hey, understand, they operate by a different set of logic and reason and principles and rules. You know, the faith world's a whole different world. In fact, the scripture makes it clear over and over again. Remember what happened in that story in Acts 27? The boat went down. They lost everything. Everybody's lives were spared because Paul prayed. It was the grace of God and lives were spared. But it's not, you know, they had every ample warning. But logic dictates the world by its wisdom, the scripture says, knew not God and in its wisdom rejects the very gospel of God. They reject the cross, they reject Christ. Even the scripture says the preaching of the cross to the world is what? Foolishness. The world doesn't get it. They don't understand it, they can't comprehend it. Any person enamored with the wisdom of this world, you know, ought to take time to read the first two chapters of the book of Corinthians where God just kind of tells the world very clearly, you think you're so smart. Hey, your wisdom is foolishness to me. And I know that my wisdom is foolishness to you. But you need to understand the one that works is not the worldly wisdom. What works is godly wisdom. What we need to learn is godly wisdom. What we need to operate our lives by is godly wisdom. It may be logical and rational for you to be taking whatever steps you're taking in your life. You figured it all out. But have you thought for a moment to step back, pray, and see what God wants? And this is where he goes right into James 4 and says, man, you don't, you're not getting answers because you don't ask God. And when you do ask God, you ask for the wrong motives. All that pretty much flows together in the context of that. What not to do at, at, at the end of this lesson. But hey, man's wisdom, it's what? Foolishness to God. Man's wisdom, why? Man's wisdom comes from reason. What we can figure out here. God's wisdom is based on revelation. What he says here. It may be logical for me to hate my neighbor. They've done everything wrong. They've said all the wrong things. They behaved in all the wrong things. But God's wisdom dictates something else, does it not? Yes. To bless those which curse you. Amen. You know, and it, when curse, don't curse back. But that's not man's wisdom, is it? So you have to get, this is where James is heading in this lesson. Hey, don't believe everything you feel and everything you hear from a human logical perspective. You got me, I'll get you. You do that to me, I'll do this to you. Man's wisdom is based on nothing but the world and that which is earthly. And many times he goes on to say that which is demonic. 
The wisdom of man comes to nothing, basically. But the wisdom that comes from God endures forever. It's eternal. And this is where he goes with this lesson at this point. And he begins to talk about the heart of the wise man and the heart of the foolish man and how they relate. And then he talks about the fruit that comes out of a foolish man's heart. And he talks about the fruit that comes from the wise man's heart. Remember, just before this last week, we talked about the kind uh, of what comes out of a person's heart. It, the words are essentially what's in the heart. You can't get bitter water from a sweet well. You can't get sweet water from a bitter well. You don't get figs from, from a grapevine. It's what's inside is what comes out. So the importance is, he's been talking about what comes out last week. He's talking about now let's deal with what's inside. Because that's what's really important. And the what's inside has to come from God. The heart of the wise man versus the heart of the foolish man is, is the avenue who begins to, he begins to go to. And he talks about, first of all, the qualities. And he gives two qualities as he lays this out before us of a man who, or a woman whose heart is filled with wisdom. And he says, you know, and, and, and he puts it down here. He says, listen, if you're, if you're wise, you have understanding. Verse 1, verse 13, let him show what? Your wisdom let him show your understanding by your good behavior in deeds and your gentleness in wisdom. So there's two things here. First of all, he talks about good behavior. If you have a King James Version, it says here, you're, let him show by your conversation. And that's not really good for our world today. Now in 1611, when that was translated, that word in the Greek language was translated to an English word. That was a good word because then conversation that word was used in a wider sense. It meant more than just what you speak. It meant what you are. It dealt with the, the broader meaning of the, the conduct of your life. In other words, if, you, if, you, uh, if you're really wise, it'll be demonstrated by the conduct of your life. And by that I mean, and he uses this Greek word anastrophe. And this word, this anastrophe word, it has a meaning of conversion. In other words, if you have wisdom, then it's being demonstrated by the conversion that's going on in your life. And it's a word that was used to talk, but take, uh, uh, used to talk about things to be turned inside out or upside down, you know. It, 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 in other words, it, it's, diff it's not what it used to be. He says, if you really have wisdom, it'll be seen in your life because it's backwards from what everybody else is living. It's different. It's upside down. It's inside out. It's not the way the world operates. It's just the reverse. It's not the wisdom of the world, it's the wisdom of God. So he's saying here, but the, the, behind the concept, the word uh, anastrophe, the concept idea is a changed life. Now as Christians we know, if any man's a Christ, he's a new creation. But we also know that I have been made new. But now that new creation is starting to live out. This maturing process is taking place. And we dealt with that last week. We talked about how our lips display where we are in the progress of that maturity often, right? So he said, if, if you're really wise and you have wisdom, it's going to be seen by the way you're living your life and your willingness to accept the changes that the Holy Spirit is bringing into your life. Is God able to turn you upside down? You are not what you used to be. In the way you act, in the way you speak, is there a difference being made? Now, if there's not a willingness to change, if we just, I'm setting my ways, that's just the way I are, brother. I just, I'm just, it's way, it's way, my daddy was like that, my grandpa was like that, my mama was like that, that's the way I am. That's not wisdom. Well, not from God's perspective. It may be earthly wisdom, but that's not God's wisdom. Wisdom says, you're the potter, I'm the clay. A great illustration of that when Paul's talking about real faith in Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 5, he's talking about we're saved by, by faith. But now that we've been saved by faith, he goes into Romans chapter 6. So now we're identified with Christ, buried with Christ, raised, walking a new life. He says, he said, we have believed from the heart. You know, the, the New American Standard puts it in verse 17, something like this. You have believed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. Now, what does that mean? The word form there is the same word that we use for, in, from the Greek language. to the, It's a good translation, like, a, like if we're going to pour a concrete for a building or a garage, a barn, a building, whatever it be. If the building's 10 by 10 or 100 by 200, we build the form, right, to match the plan. And what happens is we put the steel in and then the next thing to happen is what? We deliver the cement. 
He says, you have obeyed from the heart the form to which you were delivered. The form is Jesus. The form is the word of God. The form is the truth of scripture. He says, you have been delivered to that. Now, if you read it in King James, it's kind of like the opposite. It's, it's not real accurate. It's, 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 that, it's that the word's being delivered. You, you believe in the heart that the truth that was delivered to you. But the actual Greek translation that says you're being delivered to the form. Now, what happens? Well, if you've ever worked construction, you got some guys out there with their big boots on and these big spatula kind of things. One of the, they're, they're pressing that out to meet what? The form. The concrete is pressed to meet the form so that when you take the form boards off, it's exactly the way it's supposed to be. Guess what happens? Our lives are being poured into this form. This form is the word of God. He said, you were de delivered to the form of doctrine, the truth of scripture, and you've been to And what's happening? God has taken the Holy Spirit and circumstance and trials and situations of life and pressing you in to the form so that you can be shaped in the very image of the Lord Jesus Christ, God's eternal plan for you to make you like Jesus. Wisdom dictates then that I allow the word of God to change me. Is that, is that not good stuff? Yes. Well, say amen a little louder. Amen. I didn't study for 42 hours just to get a little, a little unk out of you. <laughs> That's, that, God's form has been set. You're delivered to it. You're shaped to it. He says, that's the wisdom. It will be demonstrated. If you have real wisdom, it will be demonstrated by your willingness to change in that regard. That anastrophe where change is coming. My life is now in accordance to the word of God. I'm not trying to get the word of God twisted and changed and perverted to fit my life. No, my life is the one changing. Which is said, not only is that, is it demonstrated by this willingness to, to change and to be adaptable to the word of God. But it deals with this idea of meekness that may be used in your Bible. And it's that, that's that Greek word proutis, which means gentle and humble and courteous and considerate, all right? Now, this word was used in the culture of the day among the Greeks with those who worked with horses, wild horses and domesticating them and taming them. This was a common word that was used in that trade of training and breaking horses. The goal was this proutis. You want a horse that's gentle, you know, a horse that's manageable, a horse that will respond to the leadership that he's being given. You know, a great picture of this. I remember going to the Bill Gothard conferences years ago. He talked about this word and he had this, he put up this picture of this, of this little child riding this great stallion, you know, and could, now this horse could kill this kid. This horse, this horse has more power than the child. The horse is stronger and faster, more swift, and can easily throw this child and trample it to death. But this horse has been brought under control. He's gentle. That was the goal. This proutus was the goal in the trainer. In our lives, our, our hearts are brought into submission to the will of God. So that we're gentle. This is, this is the idea. It's not spinelessness. It's authority. It's strength. It's power. I mean, we can do a lot of damage. Amen. But we've been brought under control of the Holy Spirit. Wisdom. Are you a wise person? Are you still out of control? Left to your own self. Those are the two, two qualities. And then he talks about the heart of the foolish man. And he gives about two or three things here. <coughs> he said, if you have bitter jealousy, selfish ambition in your heart, don't be arrogant and so lie against the truth. Now, he's not talking about a, a physical lie, just lying against the truth and, and stating something that you're not. But he's talking about, excuse me while I take a cough drop. He's talking about the fact that, well, first John put it this way. He says, if we don't confess our sins and we say we have no sins, he said, then we lie and do not the truth. In other words, he said, you not only tell a lie, you live a lie. You lie and do not the truth. This is the same thing here. You know, if you have bitter jealousy, self ambition in your heart and your arrogance, then you lie against the truth. In other words, we're not just, we may not even be saying it, but the way we're living is a lie. And he talks about this bitterness and this jealousy and this selfish ambition in, in, in the context of this. In fact, the, the word here, there's this word envy, and a lot of people think of envy and jealousy. I don't know how to translate it in your Bible, but envy, let me give you kind of a difference. Envy is, is mourning with empty hands. In other words, I'm, I'm saddened, I'm, I want what you've got. 
I, I don't have it and I want it and, I, and I'm will, you know, the, the, it carries the idea of selfish ambition. All right. And but not just I want. I really want. I, I am jealous. I'm envious what you have. I want it for me. And kind of like that. I'm going to push myself to get it. The other word is jealousy. Jealousy has to do more with mourning with full hands. I've gotten I, I want more and I don't want to lose what I have. I don't want to lose what I've been given. Envy begins with nothing and wants something. Jealousy begins with much and fears losing it. He said, that's not wisdom that comes from above. It's envying and jealousy. You know, that's not, that doesn't come from God. It's just selfish ambition. What is it? That's that desire to push yourself to the top, push others out of the way, you know. And, and say, well, what's wrong with wanting to achieve? There's nothing wrong with wanting to achieve. It's how you achieve. If I'm seeking God, God will open the doors. God will give the opportunities. If it's the will of God, then God's going to do something on my behalf. If it's not the will of God, and I try to push through it anyway, I'm going to be miserable. It may be the very thing I think would make me the happiest, but it may be the very thing that ruins my life. It may be the very thing I think would make me unhappy, but it could be the very thing that God is going to fill my life with joy. So we, the idea here is if I have a heart of wisdom, I'm putting these things in God's hands. I'm allowing God to change my heart, my mind, my life, but I'm also not trying to get to a place so that I can demonstrate how marvelous I am. And he's talking again about these teachers at one point because there's a lot of times in church leadership and because he's talking to the church here, all right, be silly, say this, we're talking about IBM or Xerox or somebody here. He's talking to the church. He said, you need to be cautious. How many of you said just trying to be seen or to be heard or to be noticed or I got to be a main cog in the wheel. I want people to recognize me. Is that just selfishness and it's selfish ambition and it's not something that comes from God. If you're supposed to be a place, God will make sure you get there. It'll happen. But if you're not supposed to be there, you're going to make yourself miserable. If you're supposed to be there, hey, God will wreck everything to make it happen if necessary. So leave these things in the context of the body of Christ to where, what God is doing. Otherwise, it's going to create problems. In fact, he talks about the, the fruit of the foolish man as he gets into verses 14 and 16. And he talks about, you know, he kind of ends it with saying it's demonic. But let me start with demonic and we'll come back to it in just a moment. I have been preaching for men probably 110 years now. Seems like sometimes. I've been in ministry for a long time, you know, 40 plus years. 16 of that years in preaching in a lot of different churches. I mean, I, and I'm talking about from Methodist to Charismatic to Pentecostal to Baptist, all different kinds of scenarios, all different circles. It didn't matter what the denomination was. I went into a lot of those churches and they were a picture of what James is warning against here. With a lot of strife and a lot of division you know, and it, and it didn't take long for somebody to come tell me what they thought the church needed to hear. You know, I was there for them to straighten the church out for what they thought were the problems. And I'm sure you know how well those meetings went. I mean, I had a guy coming up, and, you know, I traveled in a big bus back then, I had a big Greyhound bus, and it was a motor coach. I had a guy knock on the door one night, about the first night of the revival we were in, and uh, he was kind of standing there sheep. He said, can I talk to you for a minute? He said, sure, come on in. He came in and began to tell me all the things that were wrong with the pastor. And uh, I, you know, just really strange way it was all happening. It was like, it's like he was quoting some things. And I said, did somebody send you here? Uh, yeah, uh, uh, the deacons. I said, are you a deacon? No. I said, I know what you are. I said, what? I said, a coward. <laughs> I said, it's, you're sitting here, and we had a long discussion about what was going on and how basically my mindset and construct with him was, this is so demonic what you're doing. This is so against the word. Of God. And you may be 100% right, but what they're doing is 100% wrong. The way that, oh, it made logical sense, let's do it this way. Let's approach them this way. And, if, and this is important, you may be right, but if what you're doing is causing problems and creating heartache and division and strife and manifesting itself with jealousy and envy and selfish ambition, I don't care how right you are, you're wrong. And we all know that we can be right and do stuff the wrong way, isn't that right? I mean, how many of you seen that in your marriage? Well, your intentions were good. It went nowhere real fast. 
Because what, how you did what you did wasn't necessarily wisdom. It was wisdom from the earth and wisdom from men. You know, but there's a lot of problems in a lot of churches, I discovered. A lot of division, a lot of strife. And this was the very thing that James is just talking about and how to deal with these things. And they weren't dealing with it correctly and in a righteous manner. Yeah, problems were there, but they had to be dealt with righteously. And so what's happened is when you start dealing with this the wrong way and by the wisdom of the world, you open the door to the devil. You know, someone said he quit fighting the church and joined it. Not only he joined it, he sat on the front row, if not in the pulpit. In many situations. Trying to manipulate and change and work and it just ends up an absolute mess. The scriptures over and over again from whether it's the Apostle Paul writing to the church or to, the, to Timothy or Titus or whoever or it's in Matthew, Mark, Luke, wherever you go in the Bible, there's always these warnings about strife and divisions and problems within the fellowship. How do we relate to one another? How do we reach out to one another? How do we minister to one another? How do we work together? And most people ignore them. And they go right where James says, he said, here's the fruit of it. He said, one is arrogance. And it literally means just, you're just full of pride. And it, this word uniquely deals with proud of your position. Well, don't you know who I am? I, I, I got a real glimpse of this. And, uh, you know, in, in politics, you see it a lot of times. You might remember just a couple of weeks ago about the, uh, uh, the, the congressman, senator, whoever it was, that uh, got, was asked a question by the reporter. And he didn't want to answer it. And then when he thought he was off mic, he leaned up next to the guy and says, ah, oh, break you in half like a boy, you know, something like that. And I thought, that's the arrogance of leadership. Don't you know, well, I'm a pastor, I'm a deacon, I'm an elder, I'm a lift leader. Well, bless your heart. <laughs> you didn't put yourself there. Yeah, maybe you did, I don't know. That's selfish ambition. Where's the humility in all of that? There's no humility there. He said, this is, this is arrogance, you know. You, you, you got to know how important I am. You got to know how, if I wasn't here, I can imagine what this place would be like. That mentality. That'd be nicer. The Bible says, you know, cast out that person and peace enters in. You know. The second thing he talks about is lying. And this kind of goes back to what I was talking about, lying against the truth a while ago, when he says lying. And the idea is of trying to, Ignore the truth or to change the truth so as to fit your life or to justify what you're doing. This is the person who, who lives in sin and when he's spoken to and convicted by the word of God, he rejects the word of God and says, it's okay for me because. A lot of people do that. You know, you, well, I know what the Bible says, but you don't know my situation. <laughs> I believe the Bible. But you don't know my situation. The Bible says your situation is not any different than anybody else's situation. In fact, James says that every man's tempted the same way. Every man has the same kind of problems, one way or the other. There's more than you. You may feel like you're the only one dealing with what you're dealing with, and we've all felt that way before, haven't we? But we're not the only ones. There's millions of people. You know, Peter said, do you really remember your brothers around the world are suffering for Christ? There's others that are dealing with, so, you know, this, be careful about making yourself believe that you're unique and it's okay for you. I remember Jimmy Swaggart when he went through that, uh, the deal of, of immorality and got caught the pornography issue and the prostitutes and all that mess. And he got up and he said, and he just was being honest and bearing it. So he said, listen, after all I've done for God, I thought that it'd be all right. He would make this one exception for me. That's wisdom from the world. That's not the wisdom that comes from above. And then he says, not, not only is it, is it lying, he says it's earthly. You know, in other words, it's not heavenly wisdom, it's worldly wisdom. It may be worldly wise, but earthly stupid. You know, it may be worldly wise, but heavenly stupid. It, you know, it sounds good to you, but it's not, it doesn't come from God. And he said, use in other words, it's natural. This is the word psychikos. This is the word we get for, for psych, you know, uh, psyche in our world. Ha having to do with the mind, the will, and the emotions, the soul. There's a lot of things that we can... Say it's okay in our mind or even emotionally or, you know, in our soul. We, we kind of rationalize it all out. But when it comes to truth, it doesn't measure up. You, you know, as a believer, when you're really honestly seeking God's face and you're, a, a, you get some good rationalizations and some good excuses, but you know they don't measure up with the word of God. What's happening is that conflict between the wisdom of the world and the wisdom of God. It makes sense. It makes sense to lash out. It's reasonable. Everybody else is doing it. But God may say, be saying over here, this is, lashing out's not what I want you to do. Here's what I want you to do. It may, in your mind, well, something ought to be said, and so you're going to say it. When God says, no, something doesn't need to be said. 
Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. Don't say it. And he kind of hits it. The tough and the final blow, that kind of, as I say, that finger in your eyeball is it's demonic. You know? It's just demonic. When you act that way, it's not just worldly wisdom. It's demonic. In other words, he's saying, you're being motivated by satanic forces. Well, I'm a Christian. The devil can't touch me. Careful. Please remember that all those warnings about Satan are written to Christians, <laughs> not lost people. Those warnings, be on guard, have on the armor, be wise. Those are written to Christians because your adversary, the devil, walked around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And as I said last week, where's the devouring take place? Right in the heart and mind. So he's saying, you know, there's going to be this display if you're really living by the wisdom of God in your lifestyle, which he goes into the fruit of the wise man. He says, but the wisdom from above is pure, peaceable, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy, good fruits, unwavering, without hypocrisy. The seed whose fruit is righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Righteousness, peace. J. Vernon McGee, I was looking at his commentaries this week and in this passage, he was talking about this context of this fruit of righteousness and the sown of the peace. He said, there's a day coming when the psalmist says in, one, in Psalms 85, 10, you know, that, uh, that, that when peace and righteousness will have kissed each other. He went on to say, but today they don't even know each other, <laughs> nor would they recognize each other, which is sad. He said, because the first sign of heavenly wisdom is pure. Purity. What is purity? It means I'm allowing God to change my life. It gets back to that behavioral thing. That I'm willing to let God take the word of God, apply it to my life, cleanse my heart, cleanse my mind, cleanse my life, and get my life on target with his will for my life. Purity. Holiness is another word we use here. In fact, purity indicates the importance of holiness in our life. God is holy. So if God's holy, then this makes this a heavenly logical sense is that where is godly wisdom going to come from? It's going to come from God and God is holy. So guess what this wisdom is going to be marked by? It's going to be marked by purity and by holiness. The idea behind it is it's going to be free from defilement, free from sin, chaste and clean and right. James used this word about purity again in James 4, 18, when he says, purify your hearts. Basically saying, make your hearts clean, get your hearts right, get your hearts pure before God. One thing about God's wisdom that you discover, the more that you understand what wisdom is and biblical wisdom is, you, you see that God's wisdom always leads to purity of life. You can't say you're walking in wisdom and have a life of carnality and a life of immaturity. There's choices that have to be made. Man's wisdom doesn't lead to righteousness. It leads to sin. But there is a spiritual wisdom that if we choose to receive it and embrace it and live by what God says in our life, it leads to, you know, a clear life, a clean life. The other wisdom, as you'll see a little later when you kind of coast right into that next chapter, it leads to spiritual adultery. We become friends with the world. We think like the world. We act like the world. Ultimately, says that's adultery. You're having an immoral relationship. You're supposed to be in love with God, not in love with the world. Worldliness makes a person a spiritual adulterer. He says it's pure, it's peaceable. Where does that come from? Well, you know, one way you can get real peace, true peace comes from the Prince of Peace. So if it's real wisdom and it's coming from God and from the Lord Jesus, then not only is it going to be pure, it's also going to be peace. And by the way, it's a peace that's based on that purity. It's a peace that's based upon holiness, not upon compromise. God never has this mindset of peace at any price. We do that in our government. We do that in our politics. You know, we'll send billions of dollars to countries like Iran who've been responsible for taking tens of thousands of American lives. No amen on that? Is that a little too political for you? <laughs> it's a great illustration of truth, though, is it not? Let's just give them some money. Peace at any price. Well, they continue to plot. This is just the way Satan works lie and deceive and plot and all the while, you know, you're just giving all this stuff to them. There's no peace at any price. People do that. I guess I, you know, I'm just tired of fighting this spiritual fight. I'm just going to quit and give up. You just gave up all. That's right. And you, you gained nothing. You lost everything. People do this in church. Let's don't deal with sin. Let's don't talk about problems of sin. Somebody in the church may be fighting the sin. Let's, let's don't talk about that, you know, because the peace of the church is more important than the purity of the church. Never is that so. 
The purity of the church is always more important than the peace at any price mindset. If the church is devoted to God and to his word and committed to his word, then there's going to be peace. But if we just say, well, we don't deal with that. Let's just sweep it on the sand. Let's ignore that because you know what? You might upset somebody. Somebody might get discontent. Somebody might start, you know, hey, you can't have peace by sweeping sins under the rug and pretending they're not there. So that's not the kind of peace that he's talking about. Man's wisdom says, cover things up, keep things together. Don't anybody leave, you know, might upset somebody. Don't want to leave it, lose a tither. <laughs> God's wisdom is just the other way. He says, confess your sin. Get your heart right. Keep presenting truth. People will get right with God. They'll experience the peace of God, and they'll experience peace with each other. Peaceable, and then gentle. It's a little different from this word we meek, the word meek a while ago that we used the word proctus, that Greek word. That, you know, uh, this is a different word. This is the word apekis, and it means... You're someone who doesn't press their rights. I could, but I don't. I could, but I don't. Because what's more important than anything else is we, we have integrity before God. Like I said, there's a way to be right the wrong way. And then you use this word reasonable or easily persuaded. And it, this is the word is basically just, it's, it's just the opposite of being stubborn, all right, hard-headed complaining about things, never being persuaded of anything. This is someone, if they have wisdom of God, then you can reason with them. They'll hear. They'll listen. They'll see if it measures up to the word of God. They'll see if it's right. So there's this, this ability to, to have a reasonable relationship here. He said not only is it re easily to be persuaded, it's full of mercy and good fruits. By the way, mercy is not a natural thing in our life. Good fruits are not natural in our life. It comes from seeking God, having our hearts right with God, getting our lives right with God, full of mercy and good fruits. Mercy is the attitude. Good fruit is the action. It's kind of like this. We experience the good fruit of God's mercy. You know what it is? It's grace. We put a lot of emphasis on grace in the church. Our real emphasis will probably will be on mercy. All right? Because God is merciful. He expresses his grace to us. Are you with me? I experienced the grace of God because he's so merciful. If he were not merciful, there'd be no grace. But God in his mercy sent Jesus Christ and we experienced the grace of God, the fruit of his actions, that's the fruit of his mercy, that's the grace of God. And it goes on to say, you know, they're unwavering. And this is a word, may say that, but it basically means non-argumentative. You know, there's just no partiality. They don't have this argumentative attitude. It's the word diakritos, which is the word for argue. And we said before that you put that negative participle, the A, the word, in, the, you look at directly in the passage, is adiacritos, all right? And diacritos has to do with strife and arguments and those things. He said, this is adiacritos, without that. This is not, if you're walking in the wisdom of God, you're not an argumentative type of person. Now, I know this is not the wisdom of the world. Most of us choose to live by the wisdom of the world here. Some of you would argue with a fence post. <laughs> there are times I would. And that's where God has to get a hold of my heart. Some of you, you know, I, I, have, I have this one friend, praise the Lord, he doesn't live anymore. He used to agitate me so much, but I loved him dearly. Oh, don't go try to guess who it was, you never would. Maybe when I describe him, maybe I better not. <laughs> Good, I do love him. But he was the kind of guy that when you'd say something to him, no matter what you said, uh, here, here's the way it really is. He had a different opinion. Or, you know, and, and, and what he was saying would be the same as you were saying, but, you know, it's his opinion on it, and it had to be expressed and had to be debated, and it's always kind of be argumentative about it, you know. That's not the wisdom from the, wor from, from the word. Amen. This is a person that, that, you know, that hears and has a heart for God, wants to see God manifest there. So they're not, they're, it's not in, they're not interested in winning the argument. They want to win Christ. They want to win you. They want to reach other. And this is so important even in marriages. Again, getting these kind of argumentative things. It's not important you win the argument. You could win the argument and lose your life. You could lose your marriage by winning the argument. And so you're, you have wisdom here. He's, he goes on to say, not only that, it's without hypocrisy, which is, you know, this is true wisdom. Real wisdom is without, it never claims to be something that it's not. And this is where you always have to be cautious in your spiritual life. By the time you think you've arrived, you have it. So be careful not to be hypocritical. It carries the meaning of, of moderation without compromise, gentleness without weakness. A gentle person, if he is like this, he doesn't, he doesn't cause, you know, deliberately cause fights, but neither does he compromise the truth in and, and, and order just to keep the peace. He's strong 
That's what this, this is a, he's not a spineless person. He's a strong person, but he knows how to handle it. He's in control because he's in control. Uh, he's being controlled by the Holy Spirit. Carl Sandburg uh, described Abraham Lincoln. He said he was a man of velvet steel. That's a good description of what's being said here. Velvet steel. You could touch it. You could reason. You could talk to him. But he stood firm in his convictions. And then what we'll get into, which this is where I thought about rubbing my thumb in your eye, you know, here. But, uh, but this is where we'll talk more about the lift groups that. But he, he ends up with just a few verses, verse through 12. He says, what is the source of your quarrels? What is the source of the conflicts that are among you? Is it not the pleasures that wage war in your members? You lust, you don't have. He says, you want something, you don't get it, so what? You fight, you murder. You're envious, but you don't get it. So you fight and you quarrel. You do not have because you don't ask. So I said, first of all, I said, you know what the problem is? It's a heart problem. He says, you don't get what you want, so you start a fight. Hold on. I didn't like that. But it's the truth. He said, in fact, you don't have what you want because you don't even ask God for it. How, how wise is that? He says, and it, when you do ask God for it, you're asking with all the wrong motives because you're selfish. You're not concerned about God's will or other people. You adulterers, you adulterers, you're more in love with the world than you are with God. You're more in love with, you think I'm tough. You think the scripture speaks to no purpose? He jealously desires the spirit which he has made to dwell in us. God gives greater grace. He's opposed to the proud. He gives grace to the humble. Therefore, in verse 7, he goes down and says, Therefore, submit yourselves to God. Resist the devil. He'll flee from you. You want real wisdom? Draw nigh to God. He'll draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands. Get rid of the stuff in your life that's wrong. Cleanse your heart. Get the well cleaned out. Amen? Watch down here in the well. Get it clean. Purify your hearts, your sinners, you double-minded. What's double? Well, I think I will, think I won't. I'm going to serve God. I'm not going to serve God. I'm going to serve me. Be miserable and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourn, your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the presence of God. He will exalt you. And catch what he says here at the end of this. He says, don't speak against your brother. Because this is where a lot of this was leading to. Careful what you say about each other. Oh, I just can't believe he's so stupid. I can't believe she's like that. I can't believe he does that. I can't believe he, can you believe that? Here's what they did. And you go on. He said, if you speak against your brother, you're assuming the position of judge and there's only one. And it ain't me and it ain't you. Put it more specifically, more correctly, it's not you, it's not me. It's powerful words. These are, and if we were to take the time to break those verses down one by one, we'd probably all end up leaving the service today on our knees, yes. which we ought to have that kind of humility in our life and that kind of brokenness in our life. That's where God begins to make great men and great women. You can say, hey, you know, there's a different way to live my life. It's not based upon what I feel in the moment, what I'm sensing, what my emotions dictate, what my mind or my will dictates, what my psyche, my soul is telling me. What is the Spirit of God saying? What does the Bible say? God's going to give me the grace I need to operate in that dimension, that spiritual life and that spiritual world. And I'll make a difference. And I'll be different. Marked by my changeable behavior and that power under control of meekness. Let's stand with our heads bowed. I went a little longer than I wanted to today, but I needed to. For me and for you.